All right, so before I welcome our next talk to the stage, this is not the first time, but the first time in a long time that we have two, two people presenting at the same time. And so it is only appropriate that we have our two Russians presenting about a Russian poet duel. Please welcome to the stage. Check. Hello. 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 All right. Um, so, um, my name is Andre, and I'm Leonard. And uh, tonight, tonight we are going to try something different. We're doing a dual talk for dual. Uh, uh, we're, yeah, we're uh, doing this out of the spirit of camaraderie and cooperation. And uh, nothing, nothing shall come between us. So, uh, cheers. cheers, friend. <laughs> so tonight we're here to talk about our uh, two favorite 19th century poets who are of the most paramount importance to understanding Russian history and culture. <laughs> the first uh, is Alexander Pushkin. Uh, Alexander Pushkin was the great-grandson of a black African slave, uh, possibly from Ethiopia, who was adopted by Emperor Peter the Great and eventually became a general in the Russian army. But uh, Pushkin was a prodigy. By uh, the time of his death in a duel, at the age of 37, he had composed thousands of poems, uh, several novels and short story collections, and a novel in verse, Eugene Onegin, which is the basis for films, a ballet, and an opera. Uh, and he's considered, he was considered the greatest Russian poet while still alive because he modernized the Russian literary language. And he remains, unquestionably, the greatest Russian poet to this day. He's the Shakespeare of Russia. The second poet is one Mikhail Lermontov. Lermontov's ancestor was a Scottish mercenary George Learmonth, who made a fortune for himself by killing for the Russian Empire. Uh, Learmontov himself was 15 years younger than Pushkin and is considered by many to be Russia's second greatest poet ever. <laughs> if uh, Pushkin is our Shakespeare, then Learmontov is our Byron. He was at the forefront of the Romantic movement and was heavily influenced by Lord Byron's works. His poetry describes the beauty and the dangers associated with oceans, mountaintops, and women. Uh, his uh, single uh, and only long prose work, A Hero of Our Time, is considered by some critics to be a proto-existentialist work of art and philosophy. Lermontov died in a duel four years after Pushkin. He was 27 years old. So we shall be talking about these poets, their art, and their duels, as well as the pointless, stupid, and avoidable deaths. Well, hold, on, hold on, hold on, hold on. OK, so uh, friend, their deaths, while tragic, were not pointless and stupid. The duels they fought were an extension of their art. I mean, these were men who wrote without limits, who lived and loved without limits, who fought without limits. And as a consequence, they perished for the purity of their poetry. If they had refused to fight in deadly duels, they wouldn't be the great artists that they were, nor the legends that they would eventually become. Poppycock. Poppycock. <laughs> Balderdash. You are perfectly blithering, my dear men. Poppy. Their deaths were an outcome of the Russian aristocracy's fascination with a useless code of honor nothing to do with their individual artistic ability. Their deaths made them slave to society's whims. Poppycock, boulder dash, my friend, you insult me, but what is infinitely worse, you insult the memories of Pushkin and Lermontov, and this outrage will not stand! 
in front of all these people, I challenge you! <laughs> Hear it now! Well, well. <laughs> so be it, so be it. Um, I accept, I accept your challenge, uh, but as you are the challenger, I believe mine is the cho choice of weapons. What shall it be? Pistols, daggers. I was thinking, um, I was thinking uh, we'll let the audience decide uh, which one of us shall prevail. Yeah? The audience. Yeah, really? The audience. Yeah. I, I mean, <laughs> I mean, look, look at them. How can they decide? They don't know anything. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Well, I mean, yeah, granted, it's a fairly obscure topic, but why don't we tell them the facts? Okay, then. All right. The facts. The facts. Bushkin's Eugene Onegin is the story of a 20-something-year-old uh, wastrel, dandy, and shallow pazur. In other words, your average San Francisco millennial. Uh, the book is a deliberate subversion of the romantic ideal. Uh, so Pushkin reads Byron, but he's not a hero. Uh, er, Onegin reads Byron, but he's not a hero. Um, while at his country estate, Eugene Onegin befriends a young poet named Lensky, who grows jealous of Eugene's attention to his fiancée, Olga. Now, Onegin, as you can tell by this painting, isn't really interested in Olga or anything. He's just very bored. Um, and Lansky rather thoughtlessly challenges Onegin to a duel, which is in some ways the only event in the novel. Now, in a pistol, it is a pistol duel. Pistol duels became fashionable in Europe during the early 19th century. However, they were not a simple replacement for the earlier sword duel, which you know, we heard about earlier in the show. Um, sword duels, <laughs> unlike, unlike uh, pistols duels, duels, were relatively safe. Uh, as long as the foes fought to first blood, the chances of death were fairly low. Um, a different matter with high caliber smooth barrel pistols, such as the pair that you see there, uh, you know, this is a 50 caliber pistol, and being smooth bore, it's notoriously difficult to aim. And so one could not predict whether a shot would miss, maim, or murder as, at as, as close as 10 paces, right? Because of this fact, pistol duels were more egalitarian. The weak could challenge the strong, the old could challenge the young, the unskilled, the experienced, with relatively equal chances of survival, which is to say, rather low chances. <laughs> so let us look at the Onegin Lansky duel more closely by way of illustration. The challenge has been made, the seconds have confirmed, the pistols are loaded. Here's a passage that describes the duel itself. The second, Zaretsky paces off their fate at 30 steps with fine precision, then leads each man to where he'll stand, and each takes pistol into hand. Approach at will, advancing coldly, with quiet, firm, yet measured tread. Not aiming yet, the foes took boldly the first four steps that lay ahead. Four fateful steps, the space decreasing, Onegin then, while still not ceasing his slow advance, was first to raise his pistol with a level gaze. Five paces more, while Lansky waited, to close one eye and only then to take his aim, and that was when Onegin fired. The hour fated has struck at last. The poet stops, and silently his pistol drops. By the time Pushkin was writing the book in the 1820s, pistol duels had become highly codified and increasingly elaborate. Uh, the duel Onegin and Lensky were fighting was of the type fire at will with convergence, so-called because it would start at a certain number of paces with the foes converging on two barriers, right? Which you can see here, little flags, which are imaginary lines, usually a flag or a handkerchief or a cane. Um, and the distance between those varied from eight to 15 paces. The first man to fire 
uh, would remain in place, and uh, if he missed, the other foe could come as close as he wanted to his barrier and literally execute, uh, execute the first one um, with a free shot. If both missed, uh, the duel would generally stop or sometimes it would just restart to the beginning. So from the steps counted off in the poem, we can assume that for Onegin and Lenski, the barriers were set 10 paces apart, which is at the shorter end of the deadly range. Uh, Russians were latecomers to European-style dueling, but they took to it with gusto. The deadliness was considered to be a feature, uh, not a bug. Uh, they were notorious uh, for fighting duels at short, bloody distances. Um, it was not uncommon uh, to have the, the barriers at eight, to be the original distance to be 20 paces. Uh, a deadlier variant was the stationary duel, uh, which it, during which people would remain in place and then fire on command. Now, um, in Europe, people fought those at 30 paces. Now, if you don't know what 30 paces is, it's about from this wall to the back wall. So that's, that's pretty far. Um, in, uh, in Russia, uh, sometimes people fought these at six paces. Uh, <laughs> Which, <laughs> which uh, is sort of about the distance uh, between the two speakers. Um, usually in one of those, somebody would die. Uh, the only thing that was more insane was the handkerchief duel, where two people would hold a handkerchief between them uh, while firing at each other with only one pistol loaded. So it was more of a game of chance. Um, <laughs> So the fact that Anagin fires while still moving, if you remember back to the lyrics of the poem, uh, tells that he was probably aiming to miss. But of course, uh, smoothbore pistols make short work of best laid plans of mice and men. Now, uh, Pushkin himself was quite qualified to write about duels, having challenged and having been challenged over 30 times. Yeah, but, but only about one-sixth of those challenges actually led to showdowns on the field of honor. This was in no small part due to the interventions of Pushkin's seconds. Now, technically, a second is a friend of the duelist who is tentatively charged with organizing the duel, but the real purpose of the second is to make peace between the real two warring parties and make sure that nobody kills anybody. Think of the second as your slightly more sober friend at the bar who is trying to calm you down after some fucking asshole just spilled your drink. Now, don't get me wrong, your buddy has your back if shit goes down, but he would much rather prefer that nobody gets hurt and nobody calls the cops. By the way, uh, dueling in Russia was highly illegal. It could carry all the way up to the death penalty, which uh, added motivation for the seconds to make sure that the duels didn't actually happen. This was quite fortunate for Pushkin because the dude loved to challenge people at the drop of the hat for the most frivolous of reasons. He challenged critics of his poetry. He challenged people that shushed him at the theater. Uh, so one time uh, he challenged a guy because his wife acted rudely. Uh, this other time Pushkin was at a duel and he didn't like how the second was running the duel so he challenged the second to the duel. I mean, I'm just glad that Pushkin never took the morning part because things would have gotten ugly. Uh, now this makes Pushkin sound like some sort of like a violent uh, maniac animal but uh, Pushkin was actually kind of a peaceful guy for his time. I mean, when he did fight a duel, he never fired first, and when it was his turn to shoot, he went against the dueling code, and he fired into the air. Almost each and every time, never at his opponent. He didn't appear to want to hurt anyone. So why did he actually fight? Well, of course, honor was a stake and all that, but he also did it for the thrill. I mean, Pushkin was a compulsive gambler, and the highest stake that he could make was his own life. To him, dueling was an extreme sport, like free climbing or base jumping for, for some. He got a real kick out of it. 
Though, like some uh, poetry-loving, uh, poetry-writing Batman, he seemed to have a strict no-killing rule. Uh, he only broke this rule exactly once at his fatal final duel with tragic consequences. Things started to go wrong for Pushkin in 1836 when a dashing young French diplomat named Dantes began to make a name for himself in St. Petersburg. Dantes really fell for Pushkin's lovely wife, Natalia. I mean, who wouldn't look at her? She was considered by her contemporaries to be the most beautiful woman in Russia. Dantes began to pursue her relentlessly. Whether or not he was successful isn't known, but the Russian aristocracy began to gossip about Dantes's erotic conquests with Pushkin's wife. Pushkin was furious. He challenged Dantes to a duel, and Dantes basically went, yo, bro, I'm not trying to get with your wife, I'm trying to get with your wife's sister. Uh, Dantes actually married Pushkin's sister-in-law and the duel was called off, though the marriage made things much, much worse because now Dantes was technically family, so he could spend as much time with, uh, with Pushkin's wife as he wanted. Pushkin began to receive anonymous French letters calling him uh, a member of the Society of Cockles. Uh, this wouldn't stand. So finally, Pushkin writes a letter to Dantes's stepfather, the Dutch ambassador. It's really insulting. Dantes has no choice but to challenge Pushkin to a duel, and Pushkin gets to set the terms. The terms were deadly. 20 paces, barriers set to 10. Both men fire as long as it takes until one is wounded or dead. The two men met one cold winter morning at the infamous Chornerica, the Black River. Dantes fired first and struck Pushkin in the belly. He fell into the snow to the ground. Pushkin summoned all his strength, overriding the pain, and aimed for the very first time in his life, shooting to kill. Uh, the bullet gazed, grazed his enemy's flesh, but it was only a flesh wound. Pushkin himself was not so lucky. Uh, after two days of agonizing pain, he, he died. Uh, all of literature-loving Russia was in mourning. And whereas for the douchebag Dantes, he was exiled back to France, he became a successful politician and led a long and boring life. Politicians, politicians, am I right? Pushkin on his deathbed. While alive, Pushkin distanced himself from the uh, potential associations with the characters of Eugene Onegin. But after his death, the parallels between him and his hapless hero, Lansky, did not go unnoticed. In fact, even the details of Pushkin's duel, as recounted by contemporaries, sometimes appear to be plagiarized from the novel. After all, both duels take, took place in winter. Uh, both men were consumed by jealousy, and so on and so forth. Now, uh, Mikhail Lermontov was 22 when the news of Pushkin's death coursed through the Beaumont. Uh, not content with simply mourning and ins incensed at the death, he wrote a po poem called Death of a Poet, in which he blamed the Russian high society and the court and the Tsar for the bloody travesty. In effect, accusing them of conspiring to kill a troublesome free-thinking poet. In this poem, Lermontov tacitly compares Pushkin to Lensky. Quote, and so he's slain and taken by the grave, like that poet, a victim of senseless jealousy, who was portrayed by him with such marvelous, marvelous strength. Um, a couple of weeks later, Lermontov, who was a military officer, uh, was arrested for this poem and transferred to active military duty in the Caucasus. Uh, the site of Russia's endless conflicts with native uh, mountain clans, which launched his fame literally overnight. Uh, while in the Caucasus, he wrote, uh, and his writing departed from the sort of naive romanticism of his earlier work. Uh, he wrote a narrative poem called The Demon, about a demon's love for a mortal woman, uh, which cemented his reputation for dark, byronic sensuality. Uh, that is to say, he became a hit with the ladies. Um, he also fought the front lines of the war, uh, by all accounts, bravely. Uh, his vanguard, uh, quote, 
Like a comet, wandered everywhere, appearing where it wished to be. In battle, they looked for the most dangerous places. It was upon his return to St. Petersburg, and shortly before the publication of his first novel, that Lermontov fought his first recorded duel with uh, one Monsieur de Barant, uh, another French uh, diplomat, which is kind of a theme. Uh, the two started with uh, rapiers, but after Lermontov's sword broke, switched to pistols. Uh, Barant missed, and Lermontov fired into the air, much like Pushkin. Uh, remarkably, the guns the two were using were the same pair that uh, Pushkin and Dantes used in their own duel. Uh, so it turns out that Dantes' second borrowed them from de Barant's father. Um, the focal point of Lermontov's only novel, The Hero of Our Times, is also a duel. The main character, Pichorin, uh, whose notebooks we're supposedly reading, is the prototypical superfluous man. He's a dashing officer with a streak of nihilism and existential ennui, a mile wide. Uh, the lines from the introduction were used by Albert Camus uh, to preface the, his novel, The Fall. Uh, Pichorin quarrels with an old acquaintance, one Grushnitsky, over a woman, uh, Princess Mary, uh, while in a mountain resort. If Pichorin is a Byronic hero, Grushnitsky is a parody. He is pompous, vain, and blasé. Grushnitsky conspires with the second to humiliate Pichorin by not loading his gun at the duel. Pichorin, who's aware of this plot, goes through with, uh, with the duel, but modifies the already highly deadly terms, which are six paces, um, stationary, which once again is across this stage. And uh, he suggests that they stand over a steep ravine. That way, even the slightest wound would kill. Uh, this perturbs Grushnitsky enough to miss, of the rich point Pichurian executes him. So, uh, after Lermontov's duel with the Frenchman, he was arrested again and exiled to fight in the Caucasus again. And at a Caucasus mountain resort, he meets, uh, meets up with an old classmate and drinking buddy of his, one Martinov. Now, Martinov was a, uh, he was a fop, an outrageous womanizer. He was pompous, and some contemporaries claimed that he was the inspiration for the character of Grushinsky. Martinov liked to dress up in native Circassian garb with a long mountain dagger hanging by his side. Uh, Lermontov teased him about this mercilessly, and Martinov was kind of cool with this most of the time until one fateful night. Uh, so Martinov and Lermontov are chilling at a party, uh, Martinov is uh, flirting with this beautiful woman when all of a sudden Lermontov on the other side of the room makes a joke about Martinov calling him the mountaineer with the long dagger. Well, that with the long dagger. Uh, he said this really loudly and basically everybody in the room, including the ladies, heard Lermontov imply that maybe Martinov is compensating for something. Uh, <laughs> And Mar Martinov, he couldn't let this slide. A duel was called for the next morning in an in anonymous mountain ravine. Uh, the terms of the duel were, uh, it, was, it, was to be a, it was to be a duel of convergence at about 10 to 15 paces. Not too bad, survivable by most modern Russian standards, not saying much. Uh, so uh, uh, the order to advance at will was given and the two opponents did not fire. They just stood there, at which point the lead second proclaimed, shoot, or I'm calling off the duel. Reportedly, Lermontov went on to say, I'm not gonna shoot at this idiot, which is a stupid thing to say when an angry officer is pointing a pistol in your direction. Martinov discharged his weapon into Lermontov's chest, liquidating his heart and lungs. The poet died nearly instantaneously. Upon hearing of Lermontov's demise, Tsar Nicholas I was heard to say, a dog's death for a dog. Dogs. <laughs> <laughs> so, the two talents, the two talents were 
cut short, right? Well before their time, who knows what they might have gone on to do, and, but they were cut sh short by their own actions, right? It was their choice that they made. Uh, they spent so much of their life challenging other people, be being in these situations of danger, walking along the edge of the knife, right? A precipice is on, on both sides, really. Uh, on, well, on the one side, maybe something like brilliant tragedy, on the other, s brilliant stupidity. And, but why? Why did they do this? Even when nobody could fault their bravery, for, like for Lermontov, who was a decorated military officer. Um, Perhaps they uh, just went through the predetermined paces, you know, they like automata acting out a role. You, know, you can't refuse a duel, therefore you go to fight the duel. You can't, you know, not fire, so you fire at least into the air. Um, perhaps. Uh, in some ways, though, duels were the highest of freedom afforded to Russians living in 19th century imperial Russia. It was the only way to counter the indignities of an oppressive apparatus of an increasingly authoritarian state and the threat of violence from such state. It was the only way to keep uh, people, uh, take people to account without rule of law. I mean, look guys, Pushkin and Lermontov brilliantly portrayed the violent, honor-bound society in which they dwelt. But they also brilliantly portrayed the violent, tumultuous passions that dwelt in their souls. They wrote of colorful, volatile characters that came in conflict with their social order, dangerous social order, and because of this they perished. They wrote these characters so well because they themselves were colorful and volatile men who came into contact into conflict with their violent, dangerous social orders, and they themselves perished young. This was tragic, but it was inevitable. These poets burned bright, and they burned up. But out of their ashes rose some of the greatest literature of our civilization. And for this, I am infinitely grateful. So, let's... Um Let's let the audience decide uh, who they think prevailed, but I think you've been a good opponent, so. As well, you, you behaved honorably, sir, and I admire you. Yes. The friendship. You forgot your, oh. <laughs> well, it's, it's too late now, but. <laughs> All right, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you to all of our speakers who did amazing work and to the amazing mimes that are gonna creep me out in my sleep. <laughs> Up next, we have Epidemic. That's in two weeks with stories of outbreak, panic, death, plague doctors, and the quest for cures. You can get discounted advance tickets over at the merch booth. And in two more weeks, we have extinct ancient beasts, beasts and <laughs> ancient beasts and monstrous marvels, lost species, and last chances, rare souvenirs. Uh, also, tickets over at the advance booth or at the merch booth. You can join our conversation online. Uh, go onto Facebooks and to the group Something Weird. Ask to join. One of us will click yes, yes. And this is where we're going to post interesting follow-ups from the fellows and speakers. And so this is stuff that they found while researching that was a giant rabbit hole that didn't fit into their talk but still is amazing, as well as some of their research that they did into their actual talk. I'll be putting in that amazing poem from the beginning, as well as some of the research that I did. Uh, this is also a place where you can ask questions and as you continue your research after this 
this night. You can uh, put in your research that you find as well as funny pictures and whatever else you want. The bar is open. Come, stay, mingle, chat, find anyone with a Harvey pin on to ask questions. Thank you so much for coming and good night.